I will write love letters to my invisible love. To my invisible love, I will write. I will write love letters to the man who lit up my sight, my frozen spirit submerged in years of repression. I will write love letters to the man who came to my home after I told him on the phone to please leave me alone. And then I anxiously waited for him to call me every night at exactly six o'clock for six months, six o'clock for six months, six o'clock. <laughs> It's six o'clock. I will write love letters to Arkady and his eyes and his hands and his face and his everything. He said that he had to take the Q train all the way to the last stop in Sheepset Bay where even the conductor has Russian accent. Stand clear of the closing doors, please. Dun dun. And there he was, at the front door of my five-story walk-up, with his big package of vacuums. I will write love letters to my vacuum-selling man who had little to say about vacuums, but a lot to say about life and love and the country we left behind. He held my hand as we walked the boardwalk of Brighton Beach, and the air smelled like cheap vodka, <laughs> salty fish, and sunflower seeds, <laughs> and old babushki with kasinki would stare at each other and say, <laughs> good Russian Jewish girls don't do that. He asked me to sit on a bench. He said that he could fall in love, that he was in love with me. He wanted to be my Boyfriend. Я играю на гармошке и проходит на виду. I will be your girlfriend, Arkady. I will write love letters to my vacuum-selling man who lit a fire inside of me, who I let see my aging face, my slow pace, my fearful mind imprinted with lines deeper than any lines could exist on the human surface. I will write love letters to Arkady. Arkady, my love! Who died 14 months after I met him. And he was gone. Like the wind brushed by a chill and it was as if he was never even there. I will write love letters to my vacuum-selling man, and I will remember us sitting together, holding each other, sitting in silence when words weren't enough to express our bliss. I have come to terms with the fact that it is my mom's life goal to find me a good Russian Jewish boy chick. Da? Da. <laughs> you know, it started when I was 16 years old. Sandy, I was on the bus with Svetlana. Svetlana has son Denise. Denise is 30, uh, but he is going to law school. Mom, uh, I'm 16. Are you sure that this is a good idea? Sandy. Age will not matter one day. You will see. Go on date. So Denise and I went on a date to a Chinese food takeout place in the suburbs of Fairlawn, New Jersey. It was in a strip mall with a CVS, and there and I, Denise sat and had General Tso's chicken. And in between bites, I noticed that he was sweating profusely through his shirt. And when he turned his neck, I saw that he had hair growing up the back of his neck, and it was sweating also. No, Sandy. You will like hair one day. You will see. You will like it. <laughs> or when I just graduated college. Sandy, I have a new boy at the office. His last name, Goldstein. I think he's Jew. You should go on a date. Mom, I don't think it's a good idea for me to go on a date with someone that works at you. Sandy, let me work on it. 
Hey, Goldstein boy, I have a girl for you. My daughter Sandy, you should go on date. And that's a, uh, I'm not really looking for a relationship right now. Ooh, my daughter Sandy, you don't need a relationship. She's fun. I know, I know. <laughs> You'll like this one, though. The most recent one, and the last one that I ever allowed for my mom to do, was when I was living in Los Angeles, studying to get my master's degree, when my mom would tell people, people, Sandy is going to college again. She's going to college to be actress. And that's another story, but, Sandy, I was in Jamaica, and I met Tatiana on the beach. Tatiana has son, Eugene. Eugene has girlfriend, but don't worry, Eugene has lots of friends. <laughs> Mom, where, where do Eugene and his friends live? Staten Island. <laughs> Mom, uh, I don't know if you realize this, but I live in Los Angeles. <laughs> oh, Sandy, don't worry, he will travel for you, Sandy, he will travel. <laughs> Who will travel? Hey, Sandy, this is Mark from Staten Island. Uh, I got your pick from Eugene's mom, who knows your mom or my mom or anyway, something like that. But uh, I saw your pics and uh, you're kind of cute. Uh, when you get back to New York, we should go on a date. Mom, were you giving my pictures to a stranger on the internet who lives in Staten Island? No! Sandy, he probably Facebooked you. Google, go on date. Mom, I'm going to be home for literally 48 hours. Are you sure you want Sandy? Zhenya! That's my father. Zhenya, come here. Zhenya! Your daughter wants to kill me. She wants me to die. Tell her. Okay, I will go on the date. So Mark and I went on a date to a sushi place in the middle of winter in Hoboken, New Jersey. And I noticed when he got out of his car, it was his big car, that he was this small. And he was wearing a puffy jacket and sneakers. No saying you tall, short, sneakers, what? You know, you're short too, but you want someone perfect saying you're not perfect. <laughs> the thing is, mom, is... Mark lives in his mom's basement. <laughs> Sandy, he works on Wall Street. He is saving money! <laughs> that was the last time my mom ever sent me up on a blind date. <laughs> the last story I'm going to share with you tonight is my grandmother Fania's story, and it was her first and last date with my grandfather, Grigory Simeonovich. I lived in a shtetl, in the middle of the forest, surrounded by fields of fields, where the moon came out to dance with the sun before it was time to settle down. I was the cutest girl in the village. I had dimples. <laughs> and a kurnosaya nosik. And all the boys liked me because I was feisty and irresistible. I left Abrianka to marry Grisha. He was the most smart, intense, perfectionist of a man I ever met. And so serious. We would talk in Yiddish, and I was the only one who could make him loosen up and smile. He called me his soul, Nishka. Fanichka, Maya Feigala. We were lovesick. But not too soon, after our wedding night, he had to go away again. Back to the war, World War II. All the Jews began evacuating their main cities into holding camps like Debrianka. And I don't remember much before our wedding night, but there I was, this young bride, hungry to start my life, but forced to wait. Time felt like molasses mixed with honey and heat. It didn't rise, it didn't move, it was impossible. I daydreamed of Grisha, his stunning stature, his perfect posture. Lovers that never had a chance to touch and melt into each other's arms. I daydreamed of Grisha. 
It was the middle of the night. I slept on a cot in the common room of my parents' cabin. It was a dream that I had in the past, so it was not so unfamiliar. But no, it was him, my husband. He came home to the Branca. He put his fingertips on my lips and said, Shh. And we smiled in the moonlight. And there I was, this young bride, in barefoot with a cotton nightgown and a shmata on my head. And I thought, I can't speak, I can't breathe. My mom is going to kill me, but I'm a married woman, so I can do what I want. So I pulled him, I pulled Grisha, and we ran through the forest, through the fields of Dubrianka. And my feet started to bleed, but I didn't care. We just went running, 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 until we reached a field. I stopped. He stopped. My husband. He put his hands on my shoulders and kissed my neck and slowly lowered our bodies to the earth. And the only sounds heard in Debranka that night were the owls and the lions and the birds swimming, swimming, swimming in an ocean so vast and so deep that words couldn't express our happiness. He kissed me, my husband. Da 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 Fayina Israelova, I'm going to be with you forever. Forever.